Hi everybody. Our second unit is on dynamics and chaos. Dynamics is the science of how things change. As I described earlier, a fundamental aspect of understanding complex systems is characterizing their dynamics, that is, how their complex behavior unfolds and how it changes over time. First, I'll give a brief history of the science of dynamics. Then we'll look at the notion of iteration and how iteration of simple behaviors can give rise to complex patterns. We'll spend some time discussing the crucial notion of nonlinearity and how nonlinear interactions form the crux of complex systems. We'll then look in depth at a simple model of population growth that gives rise to unexpected behavior. And I'll explain what's meant by chaos, otherwise known as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Dynamics is the general study of how systems change over time. I'll show you some examples of the kinds of topics people study under the rubric of dynamics. Planetary dynamics studies the movement of the planets under the force of gravity and characterizes their orbits, deviations from their orbits, eclipses, and so on. Fluid dynamics studies flow of fluids and includes things like the study of ocean flows, hurricanes, gas clouds in space, and turbulent airflow, like the kind that we might experience when we're flying in an airplane. Electrical dynamics studies the flow of electricity in circuits. Climate dynamics looks at how climate changes over time in terms of temperature, pressure, and so on. Crowd dynamics looks at how crowds of people act, and that can either be in an ordered way or disordered way. For example, when someone calls fire in a crowded room, people might stampede. Population dynamics looks at how populations vary over time. We'll be talking about that quite a bit in this unit. Financial dynamics looks at phenomena related to stock prices or other financial activities. Group dynamics looks at how groups of animals or humans form and how they work together to accomplish tasks. There's also a lot of work on social dynamics that includes the dynamics of conflicts and the dynamics of cooperation, for instance, among nations. As you can see, dynamics is a very general field and it's been a huge triumph of mathematics and science to be able to develop quantitative tools such as differential equations that can be applied to explain so many different phenomena. And dynamical systems theory is the general area of mathematics concerned with dynamical systems. In short, it's the branch of mathematics which describes how systems change over time. And it includes many sub-branches, including calculus, differential equations, iterated maps, and so on. We'll talk about some of this during this unit. The dynamics of a system refers to the manner in which the system changes. Dynamical systems theory gives us a vocabulary and a set of mathematical tools for describing dynamics. Let me briefly give some history of dynamical systems theory and mention some of the historical big names. In the West, the study of dynamics really started with Aristotle. Aristotle believed that there were two separate sets of laws, one set for Earth, where objects move in straight lines, according to Aristotle, and only under force, and things fall to the ground at a rate depending on how heavy they are. He believed that there was a separate set of physical laws for the heavens. For example, other planets in the Sun orbit in perfect circles around the Earth. Aristotle based his views on logic and common sense and some naive observation. He didn't really see the need to do systematic experiments. Only after a couple thousands of years did people start actually questioning his views. Nicholas Copernicus, for example, proposed a new set of laws for the heavens. In his theory, the sun is stationary and the planets orbit around it. Galileo was a pioneer of the experimental method as far as studying motion was concerned, and he proved experimentally that most of Aristotle's laws of motion were false. Isaac Newton was the founder of the modern science of dynamics. Newton discovered much of what we use today to understand the physics of motion under the force of gravity. He proposed the then-radical view 
that the laws of motion are the same on Earth and in the heavens. That is, gravity is a universal force that acts the same no matter where in the universe. Newton, along with Leibniz, also invented the branch of mathematics that we call calculus, which has been the primary tool used ever since to study how systems change over time and space. Pierre-Simon Laplace was a big proponent of Newtonian reductionism and determinism. I'll read a very famous quotation from him, which sums up his view of the deterministic universe in which everything is knowable in principle. Laplace said, we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of items of which nature is composed. If this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. While Laplace wrote this in the early 1800s, we could imagine today that the intellect might be a computer, a supercomputer that would be able to model all of the particles in the universe, for example, and the forces that act on them and would be able to predict anything at all. This view of the possibility of complete prediction was widely accepted until the late 19th or early 20th century. Although before that, Henri Poincaré, a French mathematician, started to speculate on possible reasons why such perfect prediction might not be possible. He was a pioneer of modern dynamical systems theory and the notion of chaos. Let me give his most famous quotation. Poincaré said, if we knew exactly the laws of nature and the situation of the universe at the initial moment, we could predict exactly the situation of that same universe at a succeeding moment. Now that goes along with what Laplace said. But then he goes on, but even if it were the case that the natural laws no longer had any secret for us, we could still only know the initial situation approximately. If that enabled us to predict the succeeding situation with the same approximation, that is all we require, and we should say that the phenomenon has been predicted, that it is governed by laws. But it is not always so. It may happen that small differences in the initial conditions produce very great ones in the final phenomena. A small error in the former will produce an enormous error in the latter. Prediction becomes impossible. This quotation introduces the notion called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Consider Laplace's idea. If at a precise time you know the exact position and velocity of every atom in the universe, you could use Newton's laws to predict exactly what the positions and velocities of the atoms will be in some precise time in the future. But suppose you don't quite know the positions exactly. Suppose you know them only to a finite number of decimal places. What Poincaré is saying is that there are some systems, not all, but some, in which if you got some decimal place wrong for position or velocity, your calculation will eventually end up being way off. And this could be the tenth decimal place, the hundredth, the thousandth, or however far out you want to go. The system, if it's sensitive to initial conditions, where the initial conditions, for example, would be the positions and velocities of every atom at some particular time. If it's sensitive in that way, then if you don't know exact values for the initial conditions, prediction becomes impossible. Poincaré's notion of sensitive dependence on initial conditions is illustrated by the famous so-called butterfly effect. In this hypothetical example, a small butterfly flaps its wings in Tokyo. This causes a minute change in the position and velocity of a few air molecules. But if the whole weather system is sensitive to initial conditions and the weather forecasters don't take the butterfly into account, after some time, their predictions will be way off and the butterfly might in fact create a hurricane. This is not to say that this actually happens or that weather is sensitive to initial conditions. Poincaré is just saying that there are some systems with this property, and we don't know what they all are. 
We'll look at a simple one a bit later in this unit. Now we can define the notion of chaos. Chaos is used in colloquial, everyday language to mean roughly disorder. But in dynamical systems theory, it means something specific. It's one particular type of the dynamics of a system. It's one way in which systems change. And it's defined as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So we'll make this quite a bit more precise a little bit later on. Now you might be familiar with this fellow, Dr. Ian Malcolm, who asked, you've never heard of chaos theory, nonlinear equations, strange attractors? If this is sounding familiar, you might have actually seen him. He was a character in a book and then a movie called Jurassic Park back in the 90s. You may or may not know that the sequel to Jurassic Park, also written by Michael Crichton and made into a movie, was called The Lost World. And part of the Lost World actually took place at the Santa Fe Institute. In the prologue, we have Life at the Edge of Chaos, where Crichton writes, the Santa Fe Institute was housed in a series of buildings on Canyon Road, which had formerly been a convent. That's actually true. And the Institute's seminars were held in a room which had served as a chapel. Also true. Now, standing at the podium with a shaft of sunlight shining down on him, Ian Malcolm paused dramatically before continuing his lecture. Dressed entirely in black, leaning on a cane, Malcolm gave the impression of severity. He was known within the Institute for his unconventional analysis and his tendency to pessimism. His talk that August, entitled Life at the Edge of Chaos, was typical of his thinking. In it, Malcolm presented his analysis of chaos theory as it applied to evolution. Well, once this book came out, and especially after the movie came out, a lot of people note, noticed that there actually was a place called the Santa Fe Institute. And I happened to be there in, in the um, 90, mid-90s as a resident faculty member. And one day, the Santa Fe Institute librarian came to lunch and was sitting with a group of faculty and postdocs at the Institute and mentioned humorously that someone had written her a letter requesting Professor Ian Malcolm's papers. So of course, postdocs, being postdocs, decided to do the obvious thing, which was to make Ian Malcolm a website. Here was his website at the Santa Fe Institute, which had some of his papers in it and his uh, research interests and so on. And only after the board of trustees of the Santa Fe Institute decided that this was unprofessional, did Ian Malcolm's web page come down. Chaos is a very important area in dynamical systems theory and shows up in many different contexts. You can see all these different areas in which chaos has been seen, such as brain activity, population growth, financial data, and so on. We're going to look at the phenomenon of chaos in population growth, in a very simple model of population growth. We're going to address the question what is the difference between chaos and randomness, which turns out to be a more subtle question than one might think. And we're going to explore it through the notion of what's called deterministic chaos.